In the book of Psalms, we have not only the praises of God, we have not only the alleluias of the psalmist, we have not only the cries to bless the name of the Lord, we have also in the Psalms cries of agony. We have also from the Psalms screams of anguish. And this evening, we turn to Psalm 22. Psalm 22 is the psalm of the lament of an individual sufferer. And remarkably, this is the form of psalm that is commonest in the book of Psalms. You see, there are some psalms that are I psalms in the first person singular. There are other psalms that are we psalms in the first person plural. And of the psalms uh, that are I psalms, individual psalms, the great majority are psalms of lamentation. Psalms in which a righteous sufferer pours out before the Lord the lamentation of his heart. And the form of Psalm 22 is the fullest form for psalms of this kind. And it has the various elements of this form repeated. We'll look at the psalm a little and consider its message and learn a little also about the form of these psalms of individual lamentation. Now it's significant that there should be more psalms of lamentation than of any other kind in the Psalter. You see, the book of Psalms doesn't uh, harmonize with the kind of saccharine religious music that should be banned along with saccharine. It isn't, uh, the book of Psalms isn't full of Pollyanna sentimentality. The book of Psalms is realistic. The book of Psalms shows the suffering and the agony and the anguish that human beings know. You know, there are some kinds of song that wouldn't seem at all appropriate after you had seen the film Holocaust. But the book of Psalms can still be sung against the background of agony in the world. How sad it is that in our day, violence and death seems to be used in the media and in the novels of our time as a kind of cheap teaser for sex. And yet, there is a preoccupation in our world with suffering and with death. I don't know if many of you are familiar with the paintings of Francis Bacon, the kind of faces that he shows. Time magazine described his painting one time in these words. The critic said, he resurrects the image of men halfway between life and death like some mad coroner who frames the clotted residue of life. If some of you are familiar with the book by the late Hans Ruckmacher, Modern Art and the Death of a Culture, it's a painting by Francis Bacon that's on the cover of that book. It's interesting that our world does not escape preoccupation with death, and neither does it escape the cross. At an art show in the museum in Philadelphia a few years ago, there was a crucifixion, a piece of sculpture by Bruce Connor, a great seven-foot cross, a cadaver hanging on the cross, and raveled skeins of nylon stocking webbing drawn across the figure. Cynical, downbeat, 
But there still was the cross. You may have seen Andrew Wyeth's painting called The Scarecrow. It shows a field in New England. Desolate, wintry scene. Stormy gray sky in the background. But in the foreground, a cross. Oh yes, it's just the framework for a scarecrow. And the scarecrow has long since rotted away. And they're just some torn pieces of cloth flying like banners against the darkness of the stormy sky. The scarecrow, yes, but there is the cross. In Psalm 22, the Spirit of God shows us the cross. And there we hear another kind of song. There we hear the song of the suffering servant. There we hear the song that is, first of all, a cry from the depths, a cry of anguish, a cry of physical suffering. I am poured out like water, and all my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax, it is melted within me. My strength is dried up like a potsherd, and my tongue cleaveth to my jaws, and thou hast brought me into the dust of death. The sufferer is transfixed, pierced through. He cries, I may count all my bones. They look and stare upon me. They pierced my hands and my feet. There's not only the physical suffering, there is spiritual suffering, shame, reproach, and above all, abandonment. The sufferer is abandoned to his enemies, and they're around him like a crushing circle of persecutors. They're compared to bulls, to wild oxen, to dogs, to lions, And they're all around him, gaping and ravening and roaring against him. His enemies are filled with murderous hatred. And not only hatred, there's also a mocking malice because they scorn him, they ridicule him. He's a reproach of men and despised of the people. All they that see me laugh me to scorn. They shoot out the lip, they shake the head saying, Commit thyself to the Lord. Let him deliver him. Let him rescue him, seeing he delighteth in him. But the abandonment that causes the agony of the sufferer is not just the fact that he's abandoned to his enemies and that they are all about him. It's that he's abandoned by his friends. They are far off. The helpers are gone. Trouble is near, verse 11, and there is none to help. We're reminded of this complaint in other psalms. In Psalm 38, verse 11, My lovers and friends stand aloof from my plague, and my kinsmen stand afar off. Psalm 88, verse 8, Thou hast put my acquaintance far from me. You know how Luke in his gospel picks up that phrase, when he says, all his acquaintance and the women that followed with him from Galilee stood afar off. But of course, the agony is not just that he's surrounded by his enemies and it's not just that his helpers are far from him. The depth of the agony is this, that God has forsaken him. Eloi, Eloi, Lama, Sabachthani, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Why art thou so far from helping me? Or it could be translated from saving me and from the words of my roaring. Not only do the enemies roar against him like lions, the sufferer himself cries out in agony with a loud voice, with the scream of abandonment. My God, my God, 
Why hast thou forsaken me? God had promised, Behold, I am with thee and will keep thee, for I will never leave thee until I have done that which I have spoken to thee of. So God said to Jacob long ago, and God who made his covenant with the people in the desert was proclaimed to them by Moses as the Lord thy God. He it is that doth go with thee. He will not fail thee nor forsake thee. And the psalmist in the 27th Psalm says, When my father and my mother forsake me, then the Lord will take me up. But here the sufferer cries out for the God of the promise, cries out for the God who said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. But to the cry there comes no answer. There is only the darkness, the silence of heaven, and his tongue cleaves to his jaws in the dust of death. Here is the cry of the suffering servant. Of course, it is a form of lamentation that we find in the Psalms. Form which speaks of I and my agony, my abandonment. Form which speaks of they, my enemies, how they surround me, how they're against me. But a form which characteristically in these psalms always turns to God himself. Thou, where art thou? Where is my God? Now this psalm is not only a cry from the depths but it's a cry to the heights. It's a cry to God. It's a cry to the living God. And my dear friends, there is in this psalm a question that goes beyond despair, a question of trust, an appeal of trust. The sufferer cries out, why hast thou forsaken me? And Jesus Christ, of whom this psalm speaks, takes upon his lips this why, the why of the mystery of evil in the world. Now that why is upon the lips of many sufferers in the Old Testament. It's a why that Job knows. It's a why that you find in the other Psalms. It's a why that the afflicted patriarchs used as they cried out to God. But it is a why that Jesus himself takes upon his lips and uses. Now, Jesus knows this psalm, of course. But Jesus isn't exactly quoting the psalm. He is fulfilling the psalm. The psalm is written about him. And Jesus on the cross, as he cries, Why hast thou forsaken me? Is, of course, not just using a quotation from the Old Testament. Here the psalm finds its authenticity. Here you find the fullness of its meaning. Here you find its focus. That Jesus Christ cries out, why? Now friends, understand that. And find refuge in it. Jesus, the righteous one, the holy one of God, is abandoned on the cross. And he cries out from the agony of his suffering, Why hast thou forsaken me? Jesus, who was angry as he stood outside the tomb of Lazarus, Jesus, who was moved within him with anger before he wept outside that tomb, Jesus, who saw the, the horror of death entering into the world of God's creation. Jesus, who had confronted that horror as the Lord of life and the Lord of the resurrection, Jesus now hangs upon the cross to receive the cup that the Father has given him to drink, and he will drain that cup to the dregs, but now the horror of it is on him, and the horror is this, that Jesus Christ, the Holy One, is forsaken of the Father, and now he cries out, why? How can this be? The mystery of righteous suffering and Christ's troubled soul. 
You remember in the 12th chapter of John, we we're told that Jesus' soul was exceedingly troubled. And in the accounts of the Garden of Gethsemane, we read of his anguish as he approaches the cross. And Jesus fulfilled what was written in the 42nd Psalm, Why art thou cast down, O my soul, and why art thou disquieted within me? John, in chapter 12, uses the same Greek word that's used in the Greek version of Psalm 42 in the Septuagint. Why hast thou forsaken me? Has God broken his covenant? You see, it is sinners who have forsaken God. It is Israel who has left the fountain of living waters to dry it out cisterns that can hold no water. But here, God forsakes the one who did not forsake him. Here, God forsakes the Holy One, the Righteous One, and directs the wrath of his judgment against the true seed of the covenant. How can there be living water in the dust of death? Here, my friends, we see that great mystery of the Father's will. The mystery in which the Father gives to his beloved Son the cup of cursing that he might drink it. The mystery of hell for the Holy One. In all the prayers of Jesus in the Gospels, Jesus always says, My Father. Jesus always prays to God as the Father. Only here does he use the term God, Eli, rather than the term Father, Abba. But here, Jesus Christ cries out. The Aramaic term, Eloi, my God. My God, why hast thou forsaken me? Friends, again, we reach a point of mystery that requires more meditation than explanation. You say to me, how does it help me? How does it help me in my struggle with suffering? How does it help me when I'm confronted with the mystery of evil in the world? How does it help me when I see this world filled with horror and disaster and sin and death? How does it help me when I'm crying out to God from my agony, oh, why, why, why? How does it help me to know that Jesus said why? Friends, I can't help but pause. Because, you see, I can't so much tell you how it helps you. I have to pray that the Spirit of God will show you how it helps you. Show you what it means that Jesus Christ entered the valley of the shadow of death. Now, the suffering that comes into your life is not suffering that's undeserved because you're a sinner. And the reason you so often rebel against that which God brings to you is because you do not trust your Father's goodness. You do not believe that he is leading you through trials that are for your good and for your blessing. But Jesus Christ is the one who does trust the Father and who does know the Father. And all my friends, only Jesus Christ is utterly abandoned of the Father. Only Jesus Christ endures the full wrath of God against sin so that everyone who trusts in him might not know that wrath, might not know that cursing. How does it help you to know that Jesus cried out why? Do you see? It helps you because he drank that whole cup that whole cup of wrath. And oh, my dear friend, because he drank it, you do not have to drink it. Your trust can be in him. You can know your Savior's love. For, of course, Jesus Christ came to bear your sins in his own body on the tree. Here is faith that is beyond 
despair. My friends, bring all your black doubts, bring all your tormented imaginations, bring all your stifled dread to Calvary. And hear Jesus Christ cry out, From the depths to the heights, why hast thou forsaken me? For friends, this cry is yet a cry of faith. It's significant that it's from this psalm. It's significant that the psalm has the structure that it does because what is the structure of these psalms of lamentation? Well, there's always an address to God, first of all, and then there's always a cry of lament, I, they, thou, and then there always comes a confession of trust. And you find it in this psalm. After the cry, the address to God, the cry of lament, then there comes the trust. But thou art holy, O thou that inhabitest the praises of Israel. Our fathers trusted in thee. They trusted and thou didst deliver them. They cried unto thee and were delivered. They trusted in thee and were not put to shame. And then the lament comes in again. I'm a worm and no man and so on. But then again there comes the cry of trust, verse 9. But thou art he that took me out of the womb. Thou didst make me trust when I was upon my mother's breasts. I was cast upon me from the womb. Thou art my God since my mother bare me. You see, this whole psalm is the psalm of Jesus Christ. From the womb of the virgin, from the time when he was upon the breasts of the Virgin Mary, Jesus Christ is the one whose trust is in God. And the structure of this psalm is no accident, you see. The sufferer, the agonizing righteous one, can cry out to God in confidence from the very midst of his lamentation because he knows that his hope is in God. And so the psalm sweeps on from the lamentation, from the confession of trust, to the cry for salvation. Verse 20, deliver me from the sword, my darling, from the power of the dog. Save me from the lion's mouth. And then it's characteristic of all of these psalms that there comes the assurance of being heard. Now, mind you, this assurance comes before the actual salvation. The the psalmist is still the sufferer. He's still enduring the agony. Christ is using this psalm on the cross. And I would submit to you, my friends, that it's not just the first verse that he uses on the cross. The whole psalm is being fulfilled by Jesus Christ. It's being fulfilled by his enemies in spite of themselves as they mock him at the foot of the cross. It's all being fulfilled, but also the trust is being fulfilled. For Jesus Christ cries to God and his confidence is that at last the Father must hear him. Yea, from the horns of the wild oxen thou hast answered me. Then you come to something that's characteristic of these psalms. After the cry for salvation, after the assurance of being heard, then there comes the offering up of the vow of praise. Of course, this had quite a setting in the Old Testament. When someone was in a time of agony or anguish, he would pray to God for deliverance, and he would say to to the Lord, O Lord, if you deliver me from this, I'm going to come and offer my thank offerings to you in the midst of the congregation. And when the the sufferer knew deliverance, then he would come to the temple, you know, and he would bring his thank offering of praise and uh, offer it up, perhaps uh, an animal sacrifice of praise or thanksgiving to God, bringing also uh, the the offering uh, in other forms of thanksgiving, bringing his offering of thanks, his vow of praise to God, And then in the midst of the congregation, singing praise to God for the great deliverance God had given. And so you find in these psalms this vow of praise. And that's what you have in verse 22. I will declare thy name unto my brethren. In the midst of the assembly will I praise thee. The suffering servant knows that he can direct his praises to God, that God will hear him and he can cry out to God in thanksgiving. And so he offers his vow of praise to God, even though the suffering is not over, in faith he looks to God for that salvation. 
Psalm 116, verse 18 and 19 is another example of this vow of praise. Uh, You find it in many of these psalms. Uh, You find it also in verse 14 of that psalm. 116, verse 14. I will pay my vows unto the Lord, yea, in the presence of all his people. Verse 18 of Psalm 116. I will pay my vows unto the Lord, yea, in the presence of all his people, in the courts of the Lord's house, in the midst of the Jerusalem. Jerusalem, praise ye the Lord, hallelujah, the vow of praise can be paid. Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? The cry of the suffering servant. I will declare thy name among my brethren. In the midst of the congregation will I sing praise unto thee. Do you hear it? He cries in agony. But even in agony, the faithful servant proclaims the father's name. And the soldiers, you know, they were mocking and they were dubious at the foot of the cross. And they said, he's calling for Elias. And uh, see if let's give him some wine and see if Elias is going to come and hear him. But Jesus Christ bore witness to the father's name. And he bore witness also. Because he had come to bring the vow of praise to God. The cry of the suffering servant becomes the cry of the triumphant servant. The victorious servant. The servant who brings his vow of praise as a victory hymn to the God who saves him from death and destruction. The second chapter of Hebrews and the 11th verse. For both he that sanctifieth And they that are sanctified are all of one, for which cause he is not ashamed to call them brethren, saying, I will declare thy name unto my brethren. In the midst of the congregation will I sing thy praise. There Jesus Christ is said to be the author of that verse in Psalm 22 also. That is to say, not only is the first verse a prophecy of that which Jesus Christ will cry. The 22nd verse is too. Jesus Christ, the singing Savior, not only sings in the cry of anguish from the cross, Jesus Christ, the singing Savior, sings in triumph from the cross. And that's why John says that the cross was the lifting up of Jesus Christ, that God began to lift him up at the cross, lift him up, just a few feet from the ground, but that lifting up in crucifixion was the beginning of the lifting up that would end in the throne of glory. And I, if I be lifted up, will draw all men unto me. And this he spake concerning the manner of death with which he would die. He would be lifted up from the ground on the cross. He would be lifted up from the earth to the skies. He would be lifted up in resurrection glory. And in the midst of the congregation, in the midst of the heavenly assembly of the people of God, Jesus Christ will sing the Father's praise. I will declare thy name unto my brethren. And Jesus, who screamed Eloi from the cross, will cry out in glory, Abba, Father, in the midst of the great congregation of the redeemed. For at the cross, God triumphed. At the cross, God's justice was satisfied. At the cross, there was the death of death and hell's destruction. At the cross, there was the mystery of the fulfillment of the purpose of God. For a small moment have I forsaken thee, but with great mercies will I gather thee. In overflowing wrath, I hid my face from thee for a moment, but with everlasting loving kindness will I have mercy on thee, saith the Lord thy Redeemer. So God spoke to Israel of old, and so he speaks to him who is the true Israel, the real vine, uh, the reality of which Israel was the symbol and the type, the true Son of God, the one inheritor of all the the promises Jesus Christ for my friends at the cross there was not only the wrath of God that was borne by the son there was also the breach that fell upon the father now friends it's difficult for us to understand this but you see when Jesus Christ was forsaken on the cross when in the darkness God did not answer the cry of his son you must understand that then the father himself was paying the price of sin You must understand 
that the Father had all his love in the Son, that the Father loves the Son utterly, and that therefore, if we can talk in human terms, which is the only way we can come at this mystery at all, we have to say that there is nothing that God would rather have done than to have delivered his only beloved and only begotten Son. And the Father, therefore, paid the price for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. And at the cross, God the Father gave Jesus Christ the Son. He gave him up to death for us. And the amazing mystery that we, which we cannot understand is that God the Father, whose eternal love is directed toward the Son, that God so loved the world, so loved sinners, so loved those who deserved only hell and his wrath and his curse. He so loved sinners that he gave up his only begotten son. And so Paul tells us this amazing mystery in Romans 5, 8, that God commended his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Oh, friends, what a mystery there is here. That verse doesn't seem to end the right way. <clears throat> verse 6 of Romans 5, For while we were yet weak, in due season Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die. Yet peradventure for the good man, someone would even dare to die. Then you think the verse ought to read, but Christ commended his own love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, he died for us. Isn't that what makes sense? For a good man, maybe someone would, would even be willing to die, but we weren't good men, we were bad. But who died for us? Christ died for us. So who showed the love for us? Christ showed the love for us. So you think Paul would write that Christ uh, commended his own love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, he died for us. But that's not how the verse right, reads. It reads, God commended his own love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. You see, God, God paid the price. We saw it in Mount Moriah in the 22nd chapter of Genesis. God told Abraham to take his only son, the son whom he loved, his beloved son. Jesus Christ is called the beloved in the New Testament against the background of Genesis 22. The beloved son. Abraham, take your beloved son. And Abraham took the son of his love. And you have that poignant scene when they're going up Mount Moriah together, you know, and, and Isaac says to Abraham, <clears throat> Father, you've got the wood, you know, and the knife and the fire for the sacrifice, but where's the lamb? You know what Abraham says? God will provide the lamb for the sacrifice, my son. And the place is called Jehovah Jireh. The Lord will see to it. The price that Abraham did not have to pay. For you know, he didn't have to sacrifice Isaac. God provided a ram caught in the thicket. But God's provision at last cannot be a ram or a lamb of animal sacrifice. God's provision at last must be a sacrifice of eternal value, of infinite value. God's provision must be the provision of his only begotten son. Now, friends, we don't know how to talk about this, but in the darkness, when Jesus cried out, why hast thou forsaken me? God the Father abandoned his son. <clears throat> Abandoned his son to death. Abandoned his son to destruction. Abandoned his son to hell. And God paid the price. God is infinite. God is eternal. We can't understand how he paid the price. But he tells us this so that we might understand it. Any father who would give up his son who would know the agony of having to give up his son, any father who would have to put his son to death, as it were, or offer his son as a sacrifice, any father put in Abraham's position, any father put in such a position, 
only enables us to see the merest shadow of the meaning of what it meant that God gave his only begotten son on Calvary's cross. The mystery of fulfillment. But, oh, friends, dear friends, it was fulfillment. God did it. Christ died. The price was paid. And the Father raised him from the dead in resurrection glory and in fullness of life. The victor himself restores to life, is another translation of verse 29. They shall come and shall declare his righteousness unto a people that shall be born, that he hath done it. God has conquered. Salvation has come. He made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. He came, he performed his great act of salvation. He came in his own presence. He came as the representative sufferer, Jesus Christ. He came to be the seed who would bear the judgment in order that the people might be delivered. The kingdom is the Lord's, we read in verse 28. And praise God, the kingdom of salvation is of the Lord's. For of him and through him and to him are all things. For God did it all on the cross of Calvary. And now he's lifted up, lifted up in glory. For he that descended is the same also that ascended far above all the heavens that he might fill all things. And now Jesus Christ sings. He sings in heaven. He sings in praise. He sings the vow of the fulfillment of the covenant. And he sings in the midst of the congregation And he sings the glory of the Father's name. In the midst of the congregation, he sings. He declares God's name unto his brethren. We saw last night, you know, that the Psalms are full of the praises of what God has done. And they're also full of the praises of who God is, the blessings of his name. And Jesus Christ sings the Father's name. In John 12, you know, as Jesus approached the cross, he said, what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. He said, shall I use the prayer of Psalm 22 now and ask to be delivered that I might never enter into this agony? Jesus is confronted with the reality of it and he has to think about it and the darkness of the cross falls across his soul. And he says, shall I say, Father, save me from this hour? But for this cause came I unto this hour. What then will he pray? In John 12, the answer is, I will pray, Father, glorify thy name. And the voice from heaven answers, I have both glorified it and I will glorify it again. God glorified his blessed name in Jesus Christ, his son. He glorified his name through the whole ministry of Christ. He glorified his name in the Mount of Transfiguration. He glorified his name as he taught the disciples. He glorified his name in the upper room. But he glorified the name of Jesus Christ when he glorified his own name at the cross. For my friends, never was the name of God so glorified in all time and to all eternity as it was glorified when Jesus Christ on the cross bore our sins in his own body on the tree. For you see, the greatness of God, how great thou art, it can be shown in the works of God's creation. The greatness of God's wisdom can be shown in his control over all history. The greatness of God's righteousness can be shown at the last judgment when he shall meet justice to every single man, to every single situation. But you never see the full wonder of the marvel of the mystery of God's own being until you see that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. And God's name was glorified in the darkness. God's name was glorified even as Jesus cried out Eloi in his forsakenness. God's name was glorified because God's purpose was fulfilled. 
and there was made satisfaction for sin and Jesus paid the price and the full atonement was done and it was shown that mystery that never could have entered into the heart of man to conceive that God would save us how? By coming to become man, by coming to bear our sin, by coming as the son to be abandoned of the father in order that he might be made sin for us. The Holy One. That's why Paul couldn't believe in Christ as a Pharisee. He couldn't believe in a crucified Messiah because he knew the law said, cursed is everyone that hangs on the tree. How can you have a Messiah who's under the curse? Then after Jesus revealed himself to Paul, Paul learned the mystery that precisely because he bore the curse, he was the true Messiah. Because God commended his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Now, my friends, Jesus Christ, the triumphant servant, sings. He sings of God's justice being satisfied. He sings of God's covenant promise being fulfilled. He sings that the vow of God can now become his vow that he can sing praise to the name of the Father in glory. He can sing as the anointed king. The angels sang when Jesus Christ was born in Bethlehem. Jesus sang in the upper room before he went to the cross. He sang the Psalms with Peter and John and the other disciples. And somehow whenever I picture them singing together, I can hear Peter's voice, you know, a little louder than the rest. I wonder if Peter had a good voice like our brothers here tonight. I wonder if Peter had a scratchy voice and couldn't keep a tune. I don't know. But Jesus sang with Peter and Peter sang with Jesus. Jesus sang. Oh, you know, C.S. Lewis writes about that uh, silent planet, that planet Earth, and all the planets are singing praise to God, but there's one planet from which there doesn't come any praise, the planet of Earth in its darkness and sin. But from the darkness of planet Earth, there come some voices of praise. <laughs> there comes some singing from the upper room, and there is one singing with the disciples, and that one is Jesus Christ, because Jesus comes to sing the Psalms. And Jesus sings all the Psalms, and he sings them in fellowship with us, because he's been made one with us. Jesus has been united to us, even in our sin. Not that he is a sinner, he's perfectly righteous, but united to us because he bears our sin. He bears the judgment and the guilt of our sin. So Jesus Christ is united with us utterly, and Jesus Christ sings, my friend. We have a singing Savior. And he sang on earth when he was with the disciples, and now he sings in glory, for he's the great choir master of heaven. He is the sweet singer of Israel. He is David's greater son, and he is the king, not only the king that the Psalms are singing about. Praise God, he's the singing king of the Psalms. He is the one who is the son who sings Psalm 2 and sings out, uh, this day have I begotten thee. Uh, he is the, the son uh, who sings Psalm 24. Uh, who shall ascend into the hill of the Lord and who shall stand in his holy place? He that hath clean hands and a pure heart who hath not lifted up his soul into vanity nor sworn deceitfully. That's Jesus Christ, the righteous one, who ascends into the hill of the Lord, who sings all the psalms of ascent. And Jesus Christ is not only the righteous one, he's also the triumph. King. Lift up your heads, O ye gates, even lift them up, ye everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. And here he comes, Jesus Christ, the King of glory. Where has the King been? Well, he's been out to battle, the Lord strong and mighty, and he's overcome all the hosts of darkness, and he's overcome the principalities and the power, and he's overcome our sins, and they've all been nailed to the tree. And now Jesus Christ ascends, leading captivity captive, and a mighty shout goes up, because the King is in the midst of them. Behold the King, and and all the Psalms of Zion are now fulfilled because Jesus Christ is the king and the heir. Uh, he is the head of the new creation. He is the chief musician, the sweet singer of Israel. And friends, is it surprising 
that Jesus Christ also sings among the Gentiles. Don't miss that one. Uh, Romans 15. I, I don't know if you knew about Hebrews 2, and I don't know if you know about Romans 15. But in Romans 15, uh, we read verse 8, For I say that Christ hath been made a minister of the circumcision for the truth of God, that he might confirm the promises given unto the fathers, and that the Gentiles might glorify God for his mercy, as it is written, Therefore will I give praise unto thee among the Gentiles, and sing unto thy name. Now, who is it that gives praise to God among the Gentiles and sings unto his name? Who's he talking about? We'll go back from verse uh, 9 to verse 8, and you see who he's talking about, Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ is the one who is the minister of the circumcision. And I take that to mean not that he is one who ministers to the circumcised, but he is the one who is the fulfillment of the meaning of circumcision. He is the true circumcised. He is the one who fulfills the ministry of the circumcised. And because he fulfills the ministry of the circumcised of God's servant, therefore he fulfills the promises of God. Therefore he is the heir of all the promises of God. Of how many promises is Jesus Christ the heir? Uh, is he the seed of uh, Abraham? Is he the seed of Adam, the son of the woman? Uh, is he the seed of David? Uh, give me a promise from the Old Testament, and I'll give you the one who has the title to it. And at last, there's only one, for every sinner has forfeited his right to the promises of God. But Jesus Christ has the right to them all. And Jesus Christ, who is the heir of all the promises, Jesus Christ is the one who has fulfilled it all, and therefore he brings the fulfillment of all the promises. He brings the glory uh, of a new heavens and a new earth, the glory of the fulfillment of all the promises of God. But now Jesus Christ, the ascended Lord, sings among the Gentiles. <clears throat> That's beautiful that he sings. The song of the true son, the song of the second Adam, the song of the head of the new humanity, the song of the Son of God, who sings not only creation's praise, but sings the song of redemption. The song of Moses has become the song of the Lamb. And now he's the singer, the song of the King of the Nations. And all the Old Testament centering of praise in the throne, in the city. In the midst of thee, O Jerusalem, the psalmist sings in Psalm 116. That exalting of God in his holy throne. You see, that's fulfilled because Jerusalem has been moved up to heaven. And the city is where the king is. And the throne is where the king is. And Jesus rules not in the earthly Jerusalem, which Paul says in Galatians is made like to an Arab city. But it, Jesus Christ is risen to the heavenly Jerusalem. And there he is king of kings. And there he is Lord of lords. And now he calls to all the nations to come and worship him. And you have the prophecies of the Old Testament fulfilled in which the remnant of the nation streams in with the remnant of Israel. The remnants are brought in in order that there might be the fullness of Israel, in order that there might be the fullness of the nations. Jesus Christ sings the missionary hymn among the nations, the hymn of him who is the Son of God. And he calls men to the festival assembly. He calls his disciples to, to make disciples of all the nations so that they can join the praise. Read Romans 15 again, and you see the description of Paul's ministry. What's Paul doing? He's organizing a big choir. That's what he's doing. He's getting all the nations to sing. He's getting all the Gentiles to praise God together because he has a singing Savior, and he wants them all to join and sing with Jesus. Join with that vast assembly in heaven. Join with a festival assembly of the saints and the angels described in Hebrews 12. Come in with the souls of just men made perfect and sing with them and sing with Jesus and sing the praises of God. That's the Bible's doxological evangelism. That's what we're called to do. That's the meaning of the church of Jesus Christ, that we might go to all the nations and call men to come and sing with Jesus. And that's why it is that you find uh, the Apostle Peter, as he describes the church, uh, using the language drawn from the people of God in the Old Testament, you find Peter saying, But ye are an elect race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession, 
Why? That you might show forth the excellencies. That's language from Isaiah. It's language from the Psalms. That you might show forth the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. You are no people, and now you're made a people, and you're made a people so that you might sing. Christ comes to us, and we gather to him, and the shout of a king is among us. For the tongue of the dumb shall sing, and Christ transforms our sighs and our groans into alleluias of praise. And he takes away the spirit of heaviness and he clothes us with garments of praise. My friend, if you are a believer in Jesus Christ, you have a singing Savior. And he calls you to sing. To sing with him. To sing with him in the company of his saints here in this place. And to know that when you do, Two or three are gathered in the midst. Jesus is among you, and he's singing too. And to know that every time you gather for worship and for song, you're gathering with the festival assembly, and you're singing the psalms of Zion, and you're singing the praises of the king. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, touch our hearts. O oh Lord, Humble us before thee. For our tongues have been dumb. We have not sung thy praise. We have not shown forth the excellencies of thee, our Savior, who brought us out of darkness into thy marvelous light. We have not realized what it means that Jesus, who cried for us in agony on the cross as he took our place, that Jesus has now ascended on high, leading captivity captive, and that Jesus Christ now sings among the nations the great song of redemption. O Lord, help us to sing thy praise in the company of thy saints and as the missionary hymn among the nations.